Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have you join us today. Uh, first, I just want to say that it is because of your feedback, always letting me know the topics and the speakers that you're looking for and you're most interested in learning about, is how we got to have Dr. Bryce Jackson um, and Dr. Lane here today. Let me just tell you that I didn't really know a whole lot about chiropractic neurology um, until a couple of months ago at your suggestion, reached out to a very close friend, Dr. Jay Greenstein, speaker who's been here many a time, um, that I learned a little bit more about it that led to us uh, booking Dr. Jackson and Dr. Lane here today to talk about this presentation. So please remember, your feedback, I read every bit of it. When you make suggestions about topics that you're looking for, that's what I do. If there are specific speakers that you want to hear from, reach out to me and let me know. Um, I'm really excited because this is our first chiropractic neurology related presentation. I'm super, super stoked about hearing uh, what Dr. Lane and Dr. Jackson have to say today. Um, a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Jackson is a graduate of Life University in Atlanta, Georgia, fellow of the American College of Functional Neurology and a fellow of the American Board of Brain Injury Rehabilitation. He's been in private practice since 2006, training, uh, treating children and adults with neurological problems such as autism, ADHD, concussion, chronic pain, migraine, I could go on and on. Uh, Dr. Daniel Lane earned his doctorate of chiropractic as well as a Bachelor of Science from Logan College of Chiropractic, beautiful campus, hands down one of my favorite I've ever visited, um, where he graduated with honors. Uh, in addition, he completed an advanced Bachelor of Arts from the University of Manitoba in Canada. Uh, Dr. Lane continued with his postdoctoral and fellowship training and is now a board-certified functional neurologist with degrees and or certifications in numerous fields, including uh, board-certified diplomat of the American Chiropractic Neurology Board, fellowship status of the American College of Functional Neurology, and the American Board of Brain Injury and Rehabilitation. I say all this because you can read their full bios by clicking on the speaker profile, but I'm saying this is because when you ask for speakers on specific topics, we go out there to find the people who know what they are talking about. And Dr. Jackson and Dr. Lane know what they're talking about. So now I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to them. Now remember, there's probably going to be a lot of questions throughout this. So as you think of them, type them in. Don't wait until the last minute because we don't want to run out of time. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Lane, welcome to our webinar series. Hey, hi, Christy. Thanks so much for, for having us. And hello, everyone who's uh, tuning in in the middle of, a, uh, at least for me, a gorgeous uh, Tuesday. It's also, I realize, this week is the last week of, of school If for folks that have kids, which sometimes makes it uh, trickier to attend something like this. So grateful for everyone who's taking the time. Um, Dr. Lane, you well, want to say you. hi? Yes, yes, I was waiting for the pause. Yes, uh, uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Christy, and um, uh, to everyone. Really appreciate your time uh, and taking uh, uh, time out of your busy day to listen to what we have to say today. So thank you for the opportunity. Right, so we have um, some slides here, and you can, of course you can see um, the topic, when to find and consult a chiropractic neurologist. Um, and, and we're going to start with a brief discussion of even defining what chiropractic neurology is. Uh, I do this because I, you know, I meet other, uh, other doctors or uh, even non-chiropractic folks, and there seems to be a lot of misconceptions about what chiropractic neurology is and isn't. So um, we're going to talk about that and then um, talk about how to, to find and when might be a good time to uh, consult or co-manage with a, a chiropractic neurologist. So um, in, this, in this first slide, what is chiropractic neurology? Is it a system for finding and correcting subluxations? I, I, I add this line because what I hear a lot from people who are thinking about even doing training in chiropractic neurology or functional neurology, they sort of feel like they're already really good at one particular technique and they don't want to do another uh, another uh, technique. Chiropractic neurology is really not a technique in the same way that Thompson technique is or, or Gonstead or SOT or an upper cervical technique or uh, biophysics or uh, another uh, structural technique. Um, so uh, we sort of put a line through that. This is not another technique-driven um, chiropractic model. Chiropractic neurology when I was first learning it, it was sort of billed as it's one way to understand how 
all the different techniques seem to work in their own way and understanding why that might be. It also sort of inspired me to try to become proficient in, in most techniques, understanding that there would be different mechanisms where one technique might be more effective um, in, in, um, in the way that it changes the function of the brain or the nervous system, or at least have a, a higher probability of success than another technique. So, uh, but chiropractic neurology itself is not a technique in, in the traditional chiropractic sense. Um, chiropractic neurology provides advanced training in neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, uh, neurodiagnosis, and also therapeutic intervention um, without the use of drugs and surgery. And so uh, chiropractic neurology, is we're trained to think anatomically. We're going to look at that in more detail in just a moment and also to understand how physiologically, how does the brain and nervous system work? I think there's definitely a segment within the chiropractic profession who says, hey, we, we know we're affecting the nervous system when we, when we perform a, a chiropractic adjustment on the spine or when we do some postural rehabilitation, we often see that, that good things happen in the nervous system. And so I think the obvious question would be, well, hey, why don't we come at it from the other direction? Let's really train and understand the nervous system and how can we affect it with chiropractic techniques, but also how can we affect it with other types of therapeutic interventions that are, that are evidence-based and, and well-known. Uh, and so that is a large, large part of the training. Um, a working diagnosis in chiropractic neurology will include uh, what we call the longitudinal level of lesion, and I've listed them here. This is pretty general, but to, just to give the basic idea, if you're if you're performing a chiropractic adjustment, you are working on joint mechanoreceptors, you are working on muscle spindles and receptors at that peripheral level, at the receptor level. Well, if there is a problem with that receptor itself, then of course you can affect the result of your treatment to be, uh, to be different. Um, there could be a problem with the peripheral nerve itself. Plenty of chiropractors understand peripheral neuropathies, especially um, in, the, um, in the sports world. If there has been a, an, uh, an injury to a peripheral nerve, uh, there are plenty of chiropractors that specialize in that and also chiropractic neurologists who specialize in treating peripheral nerve damage. Uh, we're trained to understand what a problem would look like in the spinal cord. And again, a lot of our colleagues who um, do personal injury, uh, whiplash accidents, uh, um, uh, disc injuries that would cause a spinal cord injury. Hopefully most chiropractors have a pretty solid understanding of what a spinal cord injury would, would look like and how to manage that or how to, how to co-manage or re refer to someone who, who would be qualified to co-manage. Beyond those levels, what I often find uh, is that chiropractors don't have a great understanding of what's happening in the brainstem of the human nervous system, in the cerebellum, in the thalamus and basal ganglion, and the cortex. And I find um, most chiropractic neurologists um, that I know, and, I, and even in my own practice, and, and Dr. Lane, you could chime in here too, is that a lot of the things that we see and treat are brain-based uh, problems that uh, I don't tend to see as many receptor or peripheral nerve and spinal cord problems. Most of the things that come to me are because it's a little more complicated and, and what's happening in the, in the brainstem, in the cerebellum, in the thalamus, or the basal ganglia, or, or in the cortex. Uh, Dr. Lane, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a, a great summation and a nice way to present it. Um, it what we find is that, as most people know, uh, but maybe aren't aware of the full ramifications of it, is that the, you know the brain is going to affect almost everything, whether that be um, uh, the autonomic nervous system, uh, volitional systems um, of uh, volitional control, motor aspects, sensory aspect, everything. And so, every single thing, and that's the beauty of why this is so wonderful within chiropractic, is that we are limitless in our applications as a profession as to what we can do. And so is the brain. And so by excluding pharmaceutical applications, which tend to not work great in a neurological paradigm anyway because they tend to activate all sorts of areas of the human brain and or inhibit them, we can use all sorts of different sensory aspects um, towards brain or cortical therapy. Um, and, and I think that just fits wonderfully in line with what we do as a profession. Um, what I have always loved about chiropractic neurology is that it it allowed 
on this big quest to say what is the subluxation and how does it truly affect uh, the human condition, it it gave the answers um, and using you know accepted and researched um, neuroscientific principles, clinical uh, scientific principles, and clinical neurological uh, uh, principles as to what it is we're affecting, how we affect it, what what the uh, chiropractic adjustment does. But then it it really opened our eyes to a whole new world of what we were capable of doing and how amazing the chiropractic adjustment truly is. I mean, the more that you study this, the more you realize, like, this is unbelievable what you can do with a chiropractic adjustment. Um, and I think to me that's that's been one of the most wonderful aspects of, of uh, neurological considerations is truly understanding the nature of, of our profession and, and how powerful it can be. Um, what I like to tell patients is that you know, when they're seeing a chiropractic neurologist, that's always a little strange to begin with. Um, sometimes our medical counterparts seem to think they have a lock on neurology, but you don't have to be an MD to be a neurologist. Um, our levels of credentialing um, uh, are the highest levels that you can get uh, with the federal government and all the credentialing boards. And the difference basically between the medical paradigm of neurological intervention versus that of uh, chiropractic and or functional neurology is such that, um, as I like to say, it's a little simplistic. However, the medical paradigm really excels when you're broken, when you have what we call an ablative lesion. Um, you know, something has some definitive type of damage, whether that be, you know, aneurysm, tumor, uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease, etc. And that's when, that's when they tend to do well. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can intervene as well with therapeutic intervention. Um, but most of the people that we see um, and that my medical counterparts see are not in an ablative state yet. And so if they go through the, uh, the allopathic model, they tend um, to be negative on almost all the tests because most of the tests are designed to pick up overt pathologies. And rather, they're suffering with a host of symptoms that no one can figure out. Um, and that's just because their level of training is not in how the whole system works, but it's on what the system presents like once it's broken. All right, and as I like to say, we're exceptional when you're bent, okay? Uh, we'll also intervene when you're broken, but you're probably going to need their services as well. Um, however, if you understand how you can affect different parts of the brain, you can increase function to um, uh, affect, affect that person and that patient and um, uh, try and remediate their con their conditions, and so um, it's a wonderful uh, uh, it's a wonderful phenomenon to be able to do that because most of my medical counterparts they're slightly frustrated in in practice because once a patient has symptoms they the only thing they can do is try to prescribe and in they're good hearted people and they're trying to alleviate the patient's symptoms but never really figuring out causation and what chiropractic neurology allows you to do is to really understand probable cause and um, to then perform therapeutic interventions towards that causation and make a permanent effect with these patients. Um, and so to, towards that end, it's, it's, it, nothing, nothing comes close. I think um, just as an example, I'm thinking of like a patient that presents with migraines. I think most chiropractors have seen patients with migraines and tend to have good results. Um, and the purpose of an exam or in chiropractic neurology, it's it's easy enough to just to to do an interview with the patient and say, oh, it sounds like you're having a migrainous syndrome, but that doesn't really explain from a therapeutic model or from a treatment model what are we going to do in terms of treatment or at least a brain-based treatment. And this is, would be something different than a chiropractic treatment. Um, and so that longitudinal level of the lesion is, is our way of kind of working through where anatomically in the brain do we think there's a problem because that uh, anatomical understanding leads um, intuitively to the actual intervention that we would choose. And at least in my office, a chiropractic adjustment might be one of those interventions, but it might not be. It just it really depends on, um, on the presentation there. So um, there, I, hopefully you got this so far from the, uh, from the presentation, but there is a strong focus on functionality. What parts of the brain perform which functions. So before you're even walking in the door, you have to sort of know that. Uh, what functionality has my patient lost? So doing a thorough evaluation to say, 
I know that these parts of the brain do these specific things. This patient can't do those things. Uh, this part of the brain must be dysfunctional. And then what interventions activate and rehabilitate those regions of the brain? Um, and again, that would be an evidence-based understanding of, you know, if, if I'm going to use a visual stimulation or an eye movement, I need to know which parts of the brain are active in making the eye move that way um, to try to either evaluate or, or treat the patient. Um, and then how do I know that I've restored function? Um, the, the example I like to use to answer that question is very similar to a leg check in, in some standard chiropractic techniques. Hey, I, I have this person laying uh, prone on my table, and I can see that their legs are a different length, and I, uh, I, I go through my technique, and I correct the pelvis, or I correct the upper cervical region, and I look back, and hey, now I can see that the legs are the same length. I consider that to be a good outcome. Well, um, this isn't a place to have a discussion about whether that's an adequate way to, to prove an outcome or not, but I think anyone can understand, hey, if I, if I have a finding in a patient that I don't like and I do an intervention, I can go back and look at that finding, and, uh, and that will help me understand, did I, did I help this person's brain function better? Uh, did I not make any difference in the functionality of this uh, person's brain, or did I actually uh, make the, the brain function worse and I need to do something different? So that ability to sort of guess and check in that regard, even though you know, that's not sort of the primary you know, clinical thought process, it's, it's a way to be sure that what we're doing is having the, the outcome that we expect. Um, and so in terms of defining chiropractic neurology, you know, we are not a, a system, a, a technique for finding and correcting subluxations or, or um, joint fixations or whatever terminology we want to use. Um, this is more of a, a medical neurologist training in anatomy, physiology, diagnosis, and then a seasoned therapist's understanding of how do I, how do I intervene in the nervous system um, to affect it in the way that's desirable um, without the use of drugs or surgery. Um, we think very carefully about the longitudinal level of the lesion, and then we're going to apply interventions that we suspect will have a positive outcome on uh, the area of the brain that we're trying to target with that intervention, and then also have the ability to recheck um, what, um, what outcome we had. Was it positive, was it inert, or was it actually a negative outcome? And even if all you were doing was something like a chiropractic adjustment, even doing some of this training can be great to say, hey, uh, this person came to me for a balance problem. I'm going to do some balance tests. I'm going to do my intervention. I'm going to repeat those balance tests. We should expect, uh, you know, the intervention to improve balance. But what if you, you know, correct someone's spine? You, you know you've helped their, their proprioception, but it actually makes their balance worse. Uh, functional neurology, chiropractic neurology gives us a, a framework for understanding, okay, what do I do next to try to understand what I just observed? Okay. All right, so um, here, a, a few other examples in terms of how um, a chiropractic neurology office sort of works. We do very thorough investigations of the vestibular system, and I have this little picture here. Thank you to the Massachusetts uh, Eye and Ear uh, Center for donating this picture to our presentation, but basically our vestibular system um, is the inner ear um, system for the brain to perceive specifically motion of the head, and from that perception, we gain lots of different functions. And so visual stability is one of them. Not a lot of chiropractors are probably looking at visual stability, even though I would argue um, we should. Um, of course, the vestibular system affects balance. This is a huge one for chiropractors. I think chiropractors are the best trained professionals to assess and intervene in posture. And a balance and posture are kissing cousins. If you have a balance problem, uh, it is necessarily going to affect your posture. And vice versa, if you have a postural problem over time, it is necessarily going to affect your ability to balance. And there's almost no way that the vestibular system is not involved with that. Um, I will take a moment to say, if um, those of you that are listening have some interest uh, in having us come back and do another webinar to teach them the details of these systems, Dr. Lane and or myself would be happy to, to do that. You can add those in the questions or email um, Christy and let us know. But this is something that Dr. Lane and I, I know myself for sure, get really passionate about because you can really affect a lot of important human systems 
not only through chiropractic adjustment, but in understanding the relationship between the vestibular system in the inner ear and the way that that affects mechanics of the joints, um, particularly of the spine and the proximal extremities. Um, spatial orientation, again, this is something that I suspect most chiropractors are looking at on a day-to-day -day basis, even though I bet if we did, we would have some really interesting um, findings. But the vestibular system is part and parcel with the brain's understanding of um, where am I, where is my body, where am I um, within the space around me. It's such an important thing. The brain is asking this question pretty frequently at a frequency of about 40 times per second. Uh, the brain is checking in with, hey, where am I, where am I, where am I? And those unconscious um, signals end up becoming conscious signals and um, if you, you know, we're going to look at what types of patients might be a good referral for a chiropractic neurologist, but, you know, it, it's not difficult to understand the importance of understanding where my body is in space to posture, to joint stability, to movement, and to having a, a you know, a more full human existence. Um, so um, understanding the vestibular system is a huge, huge aspect in chiropractic neurology or in functional neurology. Um, and then um, the vestibular system has a very powerful influence on the autonomic system. I think most chiropractors are very familiar with autonomic dysfunction. It is no surprise to chiropractors at all that a patient who presents with musculoskeletal problems will very often also have autonomic problems. Um, autonomic dysregulation is, a, I would suggest, a pretty common problem in most of the, the population. Um, and knowing that you can affect that through something as simple as uh, a, an evaluation and treatment of, of a faulty vestibular system is a really, really powerful non-invasive tool that chiropractic neurologists use to, um, to relieve symptoms in our, in our patients. Um, the, the vestibular system is very, very tightly wound with the ocular motor system. Ocular motor system just meaning the way that we're able to move our eyes dynamically in space. So if you go to an optometrist, they're going to look at acuity of the eye. This has nothing to do, not nothing to do with acuity, but this is not acuity. Uh, this is the way that the brain is able to perceive space around us and use the eyes within that space to track targets, to stay on a target while our head is moving, uh, to jump our eyes between targets, to look at targets that are coming towards us or moving away from us or if we're moving in a circle, to be able to understand what's happening visually in the world around us. Um, and so that the picture I have here is of all the different muscles that are, that are controlling the eyes. Chiropractic neurologists look at the eyes in a great bit of detail I'm using the machinery. And the other picture you can see there is called a VOG or a VNG. Not every chiropractic neurologist is going to use that, but every chiropractic neurologist is going to look at the eyes to try to understand the way that the brain is working. Um, the brain... Mm -hmm. um, the eyes, almost every part of the brain connects to the eyes in some way. So you can really learn a lot about those longitudinal levels of the lesion uh, by looking at the ocular motor system. If the ocular motor system is intact, it's also a really, really useful treatment tool to get at the parts of the brain that we think are problematic. Um, another uh, piece of interest, I, I think, for most chiropractors is to understand that the muscles that move the eyes are phylogenetically connected to the muscles um, that control stability to the spine. And so if you're trying to understand where is the spine stable or unstable, it's a very useful tool uh, to look at the eyes. You know, there's only 12 muscles uh, that move the eyes. There's hundreds that move the spine. It's way simpler to uh, look at the eyes to try to understand, are, is this brain responding appropriately to, to movement of the head through the vestibular system? So um, when you look at this previous slide, that information that's coming from the inner ear to the brain uh, to control visual stability is a really, really powerful player um, in terms of the way that the eyes move and the way that the eyes are moved functionally. And that's important to a chiropractor. It's vitally important to a chiropractor because the movement of the eyes is connected to the movement of the spine. In fact, the pathways run continuously um, in the brainstem down to the spinal cord. So it's a really, really, really important piece of information, especially for that patient who just isn't responding to the normal musculoskeletal treatments that tend to work so well for someone with a chronic spinal problem. Um, so doing a, a vestibular evaluation and a thorough ocular motor evaluation is, a, is an additional tool that a chiropractic neurologist would use to try to understand why 
why might this particular patient not be responding to other conservative treatments like musculoskeletal chiropractic care, okay? Um, I know that there's a, a section that you guys can see for questions um, and answers. If you do have any questions as we're kind of going along, uh, please feel free to type them in there um, and uh, be, try to answer those as I, as I go through. Okay, on this next slide, these are typical conditions that a chiropractic neurologist treats. So again, in addressing sort of the topic of this webinar or this webcast, um, who, if you're in a more musculoskeletal-based chiropractic office and you're thinking about, hey, I'd like to connect with a chiropractic neurologist or I have a patient who I know has neurological problems, when might it make sense to refer to a chiropractic neurologist? So this is a list. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, of course. But these are conditions I know that Dr. Lane and I typically see in our offices, um, but, but um, chiropractic neurologists would not be limited uh, to these conditions. Um, stroke is a really important one. I put it first because uh, it seems like in the, uh, in the popular news cycle every year or so, there's a big um, news cycle that goes through how dangerous chiropractic adjustments are, how, how dangerous it is to have a chiropractor touch your neck. Uh, if you're worried about a stroke, there was this awful um, anecdote of the, uh, the model uh, who, who had an adverse event after an adjustment to her neck. And, of course, we're concerned about that, that patient. Um, but also understanding that um, in, in terms of managing our own risk, it would be really helpful if you're worried about that in your own patient population to, um, to have the tools to rule out, hey, uh, did my intervention um, cause an adverse event in, in a particular patient? Um, concussion is a very uh, common condition we see. It's also really um, common in the, um, in the popular press right now, especially with um, problems in the NFL. Um, and uh, vestibular and ocular motor problems and concussion are absolutely pervasive, especially in those patients who have, who have had ongoing symptoms beyond about three to six months post-concussion. If they're still having problems after that, I've never seen a concussion patient who did not have problems in those systems. Um, Dr. Lane, did you want to make a comment? Oh, I was just going to allude to, um, uh, you know, something uh, maybe a little more practical, um, uh, for our audience, obviously, if you have a stroke consideration, you know that's obvious, that's a, a big, red, big red flag for a potential referral out um, for us to do a more detailed analysis or examinations. Um, but there's all sorts of tests that you can also do rather simplistically at the bedside. You know, we're all trained as doctors to um, perform many of those. But you know, according to the literature, um, uh, three very detailed tests that you know I'll provide for the audience. Um, in, in a practical application would be to uh, basically check for what we call end gaze nystagmus. And so if you see the eyes beating, first of all, if a patient's dizzy, consider them having a stroke until you've ruled it out. So that's rule number one. But rule number two, check for end gaze nystagmus where uh, you have the patient follow, you're activating the abducens, you know, the hold, they hold the lateral uh, um, position of the eye in the orbit. And uh, if you see the eyes bouncing with what we call a slow or a fast phase, and if you're not sure what those are, it's okay. But if you see any alterations in the eye function with it not fixating on the target, which is your finger in this case, then consider that, you know, a, a potential red flag. The other is a little more complicated. It's called subjective visual vertical, and you can Google that if you want, but uh, um, there's ways to assess that. And rather simplistically, and if, if you have... A, a, end gaze nystagmus and an alteration of more than three degrees on the subjective visual vertical, then you really want to consider sending this patient uh, for a detailed examination, probably to the, to the emergency department first. Um, the last thing is uh, what we call um, a Helmagi or a head impulse test, which checks for the gain of the inner ear. And if you do a, uh, again, you can Google this, if you do a quick head turn, um, which is uh, uh, high amplitude, but um, but not not far in terms of uh, distance. So if you see that there's a decreased gain on the head impulse test, um, then that's three for three, and you definitely want to send that patient out. And again, these are all tests that can be run at the bedside that only take a few minutes, and is accepted in the literature as a standard of care. So should anything have happened, and you've got it in the notes that you've performed those three tests. Um, you know, you're safe because that is that is clinically the, the standard of care. 
So, and back to yep, you, Dr. A, Jackson. Great clinical um, pearl. Um, so, um, I don't think it's unusual at all for chiropractors to see a patient uh, stroke, concussion, um, vertigo, dizziness. And again, a lot of times I think uh, most doctors are going to have an idea of, hey, I, I'm seeing this, um, this dizzy patient or this concussed patient. I'm expecting them to get better in, you know, within a few weeks of treatment, within six to 12 visits or, or whatever your, your paradigm is. Um, same with, um, of course, chiropractors know pain. <laughs> um, not all chiropractors are familiar with chronic pain syndromes or brain-based um, pain syndromes. Um, and those are generally cases where maybe in a, uh, in a, in a new patient interview uh, or in your initial exam, the patient has all these pain-based complaints, but you can't find a musculoskeletal reason for the pain. Um, that might be a situation where you would consider finding a local um, chiropractic neurologist that could help uh, that patient with, my, with what might be a centrally based pain mechanism where the brain is dysfunctioning and giving them the perception of pain not that there is a musculoskeletal cause um, for their chronic pain. Um, movement disorders often come to chiropractors because most of them affect the neck, not all of them, but um, in dystonias, um, most tic disorders occur in the neck, and that's going to be painful. Um, and so uh, walking in the door of this patient, you, you can look at them and see that their head is moving when it shouldn't be. By definition, that is a movement disorder. And if that patient doesn't respond the way that you might um, expect them to, that would be another really... Um, really solid referral to a chiropractic neurologist who can understand the brain-based mechanisms and what is making the muscles of the neck do that. Um, there's all their types of movement disorders. Again, I think if we you know, came back and did another webcast for, uh, for Cairo Health USA, that might be another um, good topic that folks would want to hear about. Um, and then developmental delays in children. I know there's a lot of pediatric chiropractors out there that, that see developmental delays that are, that are treating it from a musculoskeletal paradigm. Um, but again, in, a, in terms of development of the brain, the you know most chiropractic neurologists or functional neurologists are going to have a good bit of experience in training and understanding um, the brain first. How does the brain grow and develop at an early age, and how can you intervene to uh, sort of help that development along in cases like autism or ADHD, Asperger's, um, and other types of developmental delays. Um, so those are some conditions that we see. Um, Dr. Lane, can you think of others off the top of your head that you might want to mention? Um, no. As far as conditions go, I think that, um, you know, that those are, generally speaking, the big ones. Um, Headache. Sorry, but what, what we, we tend to see is, is a constellation of symptoms rather than definitive conditions a lot of times, and um, that typically haven't been responsive to co conventional care. So. Um, you know, many times uh, the patients that we see are typically referrals from um, our medical counterparts or other chiropractors, doctors of chiropractic, sometimes physical therapists, um, and basically through a systems analysis approach of understanding functionality of all these various areas of the cortex and the human nervous system, you can then apply therapeutic interventions towards affecting other systems many times the musculoskeletal system, and then many times having a resolution of that patient's considerations. Um, rather than, it's a different paradigm of intervention rather than just one that's based on a neuromuscular or, or a musculoskeletal uh, uh, paradigm. But in my world, the three major paradigms would be musculoskeletal, neurological, and metabolic. Um, that's not the only three, that's just the big ones that uh, we're specialists in and um, uh, tend to work within. And you know, if a, I can, we can generally tell pretty quickly if a patient is going to respond to one paradigm of treatment, and should there be a stasis or a plateau in uh, their recovery, then a different paradigm is is typically used, and um, patients love it. And this way, their treatment is dynamic, and uh, they see that uh, that their that their progress and that the intervention is an evolution of uh, of intervention and um, are typically happy. And at the same time, on the cases that we can't help, we can know that then and know it relatively quickly and be able to um, be honest with our patients about that and say, well, you know what, we've tried A, we've tried B, C, D, and E, and um, it, 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 we've, we've exhausted those possibilities as uh, being an etiology in your condition. So we can cross that off the list and safely say that, you know, the majority of your condition um, 
is going to be due to other systems. Maybe that's neuropsychiatric in, in nature, maybe that's dietary, maybe it's uh, toxic exposures, who knows, all sorts of uh, uh, different options present themselves. So. Got it. Um, the other thing that I intentionally left off of this list is what I affectionately call weird stuff. I think uh, most chiropractic neurologists it can say, well, I had this patient come to me with these really bizarre, obviously neurological things. Uh, I'll give you one example. In my office, I had a woman come to me one time whose mouth would not start stop watering. She'd had a cyst removed from her pituitary gland, which is a pretty invasive procedure. And when she woke up from the anesthesia, um, her mouth was watering. And for about two years, it had never stopped. And that might not sound so bad, except the way that she described it, the way it was, was it was so much uh, saliva production that she felt like she was drowning all the time. It was affecting her sleep, it was affecting her social life, right? And we were able to help her. It, it was really uh, phenomenal. Is there even a diagnosis for that? I have no idea, <laughs> except, you know, she had all kinds of other things. She said the only thing she would be to help her with was uh, the, the watering in her mouth, and we were able to do it. Um, so also tend to see other kinds of unusual um, presentations which um, may find their way into a, a chiropractic office. Okay. Um, so um, if I had to rename this um, presentation, I think I would actually say co-manage instead of um, find and refer because I think most chiropractic neurologists, I can't speak for everyone, but I know the, doc the way that Dr. Lane and I operate is going to be um, – we don't want to sort of take that patient. We would rather see your patient on a consultation basis and um, send back with recommendations. Sometimes there are times when I do get referrals from chiropractors, I'll just tell them, hey, I'm going to hold on to this patient for, for a little bit until I can get them to a place where, where they're going to go back and, and a chiropractic adjustment is going to be great for them. Sometimes I send them right back and say, you know, do your thing or, um, 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 I think that co-management is a much better way to describe what what I would have in mind in terms of receiving a referral. Um, but Dr. Lane alluded to this earlier, especially in terms of uh, the stroke example, but it could be any um, patient suffering from any neurological condition. Uh, anytime you might think you need a referral to a medical neurologist, uh, consider a chiropractic neurologist in your area. A chiropractic neurologist, of course, is going to understand what you do as a more musculoskeletal based chiropractor. Um, I, I find uh, the communication is going to be um, easier um, and uh, um, sometimes more respectful. Uh, there, of course, there's things that a medical neurologist can do that a chiropractic neurologist cannot, and, and a chiropractic neurologist may also be a buffer uh, to say, now that let the chiropractic neurologist make that medical referral. A lot of times, I know in school, I was specifically taught that there's all kinds of conditions that that are not treatable or are not changeable, that in our, in our current understanding of neurological rehabilitation is just not true. And so um, finding a, a licensed, qualified chiropractic neurologist in your area could really help you understand what, what conditions may or may not be treatable without um, drugs and surgery and be sort of a buffer between that, um, that medical, um, more pharmacological and surgical intervention uh, versus a standard chiropractic um, intervention and the whole world of inter interventions to the brain between that that um, the chiropractic neurologist can fulfill. Um, yeah. And I think that um, if, I, if I just chime in to basically expand upon what Dr. Jackson was saying is that um, the, the other uh, colleagues and, and uh, doctors of chiropractic that I work with it's important for me to relay to them that I am not taking over their chiropractic care um, or the considerations therein for their patients. Um, we're specialists and we're there for a specific reason uh, to try and treat a specific condition or, or um, intervene towards that end and that the patient is fully expected to return to their referring provider and their doctor of chiropractic um, at the conclusion of our care. And so it's a it's a partnership, um, you know, between the referring provider as well as as well as uh, our clinic and the interventions. And many times um, we're going to give the patients home-based therapeutic interventions and teach them how to do these things as well as the referring providers, such that they can then continue to manage these things in the future. Should there be any um, uh, need to do that, or should the need arise, um, knowing then that it, that you know, if there should be an exacerbation, we're right here for them, but that the, the, the treatment and the care is focused and that, um, 
you know, it's going to be a team management consideration and then given right back to the referring provider. Great. Um, okay, so um, another situation, we've talked about this a little bit before, is when a patient is not responding to your care the way you expect, whether it's something as simple as uncomplicated low back pain to migraine headaches to what you think might be a movement disorder or something. Again, I think all chiropractors are going to have an idea in their head of, I should be able, I should be seeing significant improvement in this condition um, over some amount of time. And I think we all have patients, I know I do, where, gosh, this person just isn't responding the way that I anticipate. I wonder what else might be going on um, that, that is influencing the, the problems this patient is having and sort of taking it to that next tier of a, a, a thorough evaluation from a chiropractic neurologist might be um, really, really important for, for that particular patient. Um, I think, you know, even in your general paperwork, if you have someone who's coming in, they've all of a sudden they woke up and their neck hurts, and you start going through a history and you realize they've had three car accidents and two or three concussions playing football or something, uh, you start treating that person and they're just not responding the way that you would anticipate, gosh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to us that the, this person's problems might be a result of these car accidents and, and concussions that they've had, and there might be something that we could add to, the, to your care that a chiropractic neurologist can add to the musculoskeletal care uh, that could really um, show you know, a better and faster improvement. Um, and I think I'll touch on that in the next slide, which is to say, um, oh, uh, well, let's just go to it. Um, I think in terms of building trust and confidence in your patients, they're going to really appreciate, hey, this doctor was honest with me and said, gosh, he thought or she thought that they could help me faster. They sent me to this other doctor who was also able to help, and they're really working together as a team. Uh, I think that that's going to lend credibility, trust, and confidence to, to both um, providers, and uh, that's, I think, um, the best way to get a referral from a patient is that, hey, they trust you. They, they would end up referring their friends and family, even if they weren't sure you would, might be able to help, they would trust that you're going to give them a fair shake and, and deal with them honestly and transparently. Um, there's also situations where even a brand new patient who you haven't even treated yet presents to you with a neurological condition that you just feel is out of your wheelhouse that might take more time and consideration than you than you have to give. I know I have you know, two or three chiropractors that refer to me, generally they're, they're people that they have never even treated. They've just gone through an interview or a history with them and said, hey, I think you're going to get better served to go and see Dr. Jackson. And um, my goal is to get those people to a place where their, their nervous system or their condition is stable enough, and I can send them right back to, to these chiropractors and say, yeah, now they're ready for some good um, musculoskeletal treatment. So a lot of times there are situations like that where you might either send that person away, you might treat them and not necessarily know uh, or feel familiar with their condition, or that might be somebody you're referring to a medical neurologist at this time. Uh, it might be um, that you would consider referring them to a chiropractic neurologist. Okay. Um, other benefits for a referring doctor is to establish that mutual referral relationship. And Dr. Lane touched on this a moment ago is in our offices, you know, um, we, we have therapists that work for us. Um, when we're seeing patients, it's usually doing a consultation, it's doing uh, an examination, or it's checking in after they've done their therapy. Um, I know not every chiropractic neurologist runs their offices that way, but a lot of them are not doing day-to-day -day musculoskeletal work. I am very often looking for chiropractors in my area who are experts in musculoskeletal treatment because inevitably I'm going to need uh, my patient to, to, to get that care. So in our Silver Spring office, we've just established a relationship with Dr. Greenstein there and his group of doctors, and they are all uh, really well qualified to treat you know, different kinds of injuries, musculoskeletal treatments and that. We've already referred some patients to them with um, success. And so, you know, I think every doctor has an interest in having mutually beneficial um, referral relationships. And a lot of chiropractic neurologists are looking for conscientious musculoskeletal providers that are, that are nearby them. And if, if you're that provider and can uh, take the step to reach out to them, I think, think it could only be a positive. Um, experience and training. So, you know, let's say uh, as, a, as a chiropractor, you don't feel super comfortable treating someone for a concussion, um, referring that patient to a chiropractic neurologist and, and co-managing that concussion patient with them will certainly help you feel more confident to do that uh, in the future. I know in my own uh, experience in chiropractic, um, I was fortunate to start the, my training in neurology when I was a student. 
but um, it was really, really helpful to work with more seasoned and experienced doctors in managing cases that I just would not have been, been comfortable doing. And so that might also open the window for you to pick your own interest and potentially get some training in chiropractic neurology and, um, and potentially incorporate that into your own, into your own clinic. Um, okay. So how do you find a chiropractic neurologist in your area? I, I put a little uh, goofy emoji there with Google because, of course, yeah, anyone can sort of search anything these days. Even even someone with below average um, technical skills could just say, hey, here's the town that I live in. Uh, here's the term chiropractic neurologist or functional neurologist and find someone. Um, our, our licensing board, the American Chiropractic Neurology Board, has a doctor locator, and I've provided the link there for you. Um, the American College of Functional Neurology also has a doctor locator. Um, when you go to the link, it's coming soon, and the reason is because not because we don't know who the doctors are. It's because the ACA, as you might know, is in the middle of kind of restructuring how they do their specialty programs, and uh, the, um, the College of Functional Neurology is trying to work hand-in-glove with um, the ACA to be sure that those um, systems are, um, are compatible. Um, so for now, it would primarily be the ACNB locator, or you'd be uh, more than welcome to email myself or Dr. Lane if you say, hey, I'm in this area, do you know someone? Um, we'd be happy to, to provide a referral if, if we were able to do that. Um, I didn't put this on here, but I probably should have. There is also a Facebook page of, um, it's called, uh, what is it, Dr. Lane? Clinical Neurology Practitioners? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that right? I think that's what it is. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't write it into the slide for you. I believe it's called Clinical Neurology Practitioners. And you can join that. And um, it's a really solid community of um, trained physicians from all different um, specialties who could uh, help you find someone in your area who's qualified to, to treat uh, a condition that you might um, need help with with a patient. So those are different resources for um, for finding someone in your area. Okay, we are right on time here. Um, we're going to open up the floor to questions and um, discussion. Um, whether it's um, you know you, you could ask now what area you're in. Maybe we know uh, someone who's there. I know there's a couple um, chiropractic neurologists who are here on the forum as I look through who's um, who's attending. Um, or if you have questions about what chiropractic neurology is or other kinds of conditions that you might have questions about, we'd be happy to answer any of those. While we're waiting for questions, I may even do a quick review of, um, of the things that we've, that we've talked about. Um, some examples of what a chiropractic neurologist is, is going to add is going to be um, what happens in the vestibular system. Um, and again, we talk about the importance of that being that the vestibular system is part and parcel with our postural system. My hope is that in the future, all chiropractic education includes a pretty thorough understanding of the vestibular system because there really is no separation between the postural system in humans and our vestibular system. And that vestibular system is really tightly wound with our ocular motor system. So in my mind, it just makes perfect sense if you have a patient with any kind of postural problem, whether it's a head tilt, a head rotation, any kind of skew deviation in, in posture, has had any kind of injury to the head and neck, we know that that is going to affect um, the vestibular and the ocular motor systems. And doing an investigation of that is, is a really important piece. Um, we talked about the conditions that a, a chiropractic neurologist tends to treat. Um, the, um, uh, the list here is certainly is not exhaustive, and again, um, I didn't put this in writing because I'm not sure how it would be received, but I also, um, you know, in the best possible light, think of patients who don't really have a condition that is formally diagnosable, but that just has a weird constellation of symptoms. Often a chiropractic neurologist can look at that in a functional paradigm and are able to um, solve the riddle, so to speak. Um, um, in terms of um, co-managing um, with a medical neurologist or a chiropractic neurologist, um, patients who may not be responding in the way that you anticipate, that would be a perfect um, um, thought uh, to make a referral. 
Uh, and of course, anytime you refer a patient to another practitioner and they have a good experience, it's going to reflect positively on you. That's also a great way to um, to, to promote um, mutual um, referral relationships. Um, I do not see any other questions. Um, the um, the exact name of that Facebook page is Clinical Neuroscience Practitioners. Clinical Neuroscience Practitioners Facebook page. Okay, Dr. Lane, do you have anything to add as we're finishing up here? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's about it. You've uh, uh, covered it nicely. I I, um, I would encourage uh, you know all of our uh, fellow colleagues to everyone's clinic is uh, set up for. Uh, set up a little different and you know my chiropractic clinic um, I have the benefits of having three doctors all have specialty certification training in different um, uh, different specialties and you know the nice thing is um, and it tends to work well with insurance too because we're slaves to it nowadays is that um, you have rather quick clinical expectations and so you know our treatment plans tend to be um, short and concise and you know you can tell patients doesn't mean that there's a, a, a that you've fixed everything in two weeks but you know we give them a two-week paradigm and in four to six treatments we expect to see results and um, we depending on the nature of the referral um, 80 percent of the patients I see at my chiropractic clinic are neurologically based but um, I always have um, the chiropractic considerations as well and many of the neurological cases come in their chiropractic cases and you know, we, I can make an argument that there is no separation between a neurological and a chiropractic case, and um, quite effectively. However, um, uh, there's there's only certain things that you can do in the time allotted with uh, with these cases when you're running uh, with insurances. Um, and so, many times uh, we will invoke a chiropractic paradigm of intervention to begin with, um, based on musculoskeletal considerations and and look for a plateau of uh, treatment. If I've seen somebody, my general rule is if I've seen somebody three, four, maybe five visits and there's no change, I have the privilege then of one of my colleagues who's um, a specialist in uh, musculoskeletal considerations and scar tissue adhesions and anatomy chains and um, to be able to look to see for a breakdown in any of the kinematics. And, and uh, finally, if that doesn't start to um, uh, prevail, then we have another uh, doctor um, who uh, is working on his fellowship um, in internal health. Uh, about an hour away from us, we also have um, highly, highly trained um, functional, um, functional medical, um, functional medicine, well, he's a chiropractor who does functional medicine, and he's a genius with, um, with dietary uh, changes and supplemental uh, interventions. And generally speaking, the, the combination of all of those a specialist therein it's just incredible for the patients um, and uh, it works very well my my only rule um, in treating patient when I'm when I'm uh, using chiropractic care is that should they worsen um, some patients worsen after the first adjustment you know we explain that to them but should a patient worsen after two three adjustments and continue to worsen then that that care is stopped immediately um, there's other considerations in those cases that need to be explored. Um, and that doesn't mean that that's the answer for everybody, but I think that's a safe way to run the clinic. Um, and if you find yourself in that paradigm and you, and you don't know where to, to take the patient from there, that's a great time to send to, um, to a functional neurologist to help assist you with that patient, or at least the analysis of that patient. Dr. Jackson and Dr. Lane, thank you all so much for today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I am uh, so excited that uh, Dr. Greenstein, who is a very close friend, introduced me to the two of you. And, um, you know, again, I've been working in chiropractic, um, the chiropractic profession for almost eight years and didn't even know there was a thing like chiropractic neurology and it has been just fascinating to learn more about it and it really was a conversation about um, a problem with my own child that led to this conversation in the introduction um, from Dr. Greenstein so I, I can't thank you all enough for making time in your schedule to be a part of the webinar series. Super, thanks Christy. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you to the listeners for devoting some time, appreciate it. 
Um, everyone, the webinar recording will be sent out to everyone. You don't have to request it. It will also be posted on the archived webinar page where it will live for the next 12 months. So I encourage you to go back, listen to it again. If there are some um, associate doctors in your practice that you'd like to share this with or even um, a friend, uh, you know, and uh, um, that you want to share this with, please feel free. You do not have to be in Cower Health USA participating provider to have access to the archived webinar page. We believe that this educational material should be available to any and all practices who want access to it. Uh, but the caveat is it's only available for 12 months from the date of the live presentation. Just a reminder that next week we have the Kathy Mills Chang coming back to talk about using the 2018 OIG chiropractic portfolio to manage your practice risk. We have finally rescheduled the webinar um, with Cairo Health USA and Cairo Touch on how to properly set up your fees in the software. That one is also being recorded. If you register, you will get access to the webinar recording um, for our mutual clients. It will also be posted on your resources page, and I will also post it to the archived webinar page. Um, and then both of those are next week, and then the following week we have Dr. Stephen Krauss. Um, who's going to be talking to us about how spine care experts utilize and get paid for x-rays. So we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the next couple of months leading into the fall and back to school time, which is sad to think about, especially with it being the last week of school, uh, apparently in Maryland, as I learned today. Um, my son's last week of school was two weeks ago here in the South to get out a little earlier because it is hot, hot, hot very early on uh, in the year. Our summer starts early. But again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be here today. A big shout out and thank you to Dr. Bryce Jackson and Dr. Daniel Lane, who took time out of their busy schedules to be here today as well. Look forward to having them come back again in coming months. If you have recommendations, suggestions for topics or speakers, send them my way. Look forward to reading your feedback. Look forward to having our presenters back. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day and a fabulous week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Same time, same place, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Christy. Bye-bye. All right, gentlemen, the webcast is